writer, which means that I read what I've written rather than make it up as I go along. Uh, this is a process. Uh, I write longhand, or I wrote this longhand up in Vermont in August, and I've rewritten it three times. I'm very particular about everything that gets on paper. Uh, I'm a writer, and I begin an essay with an epigraph from a great American writer named Ralph Waldo Emerson. Very short, very sweet. Life is our dictionary. When I think of the uh, relations writers have had with editors, I almost inevitably recall Jack Kerouac's enthusiastic delight in the spring of 1951 when he burst into Robert Giroux's office and unrolled the manuscript of On the Road, a novel he had typed on a homemade scroll in three weeks, working with little sleep, drinking cup after cup of coffee, some of them laced with benzedrine. Giroux, who now runs Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, was then a talented young editor who had accepted Kerouac's first novel, an imitative apprentice effort called The Town and the City, and forced the recalcitrant Kerouac to cut a third of it away. This excision had been wrenching for Kerouac, even though he knew he was still in the process of discovering his own voice. According to William Seward Burroughs, who may well have exaggerated the claim, Kerouac had already written over a million words, beginning at the age of 11. Conventionally organized, the town and the city was especially influenced by the sweeping prolixity of Thomas Wolfe. Wolfe had been edited by Maxwell Perkins at Scribner's, who also edited Hemingway and Fitzgerald, and who not only cut away huge sections of Wolfe's work, but reassembled and reconfigured other sections to the extent that later critics would question the nature of authorial responsibility. Call it the authority, particularly with Wolfe's later fiction. In the 1920s, Perkins was probably the most powerful and discriminating fiction editor in America. And several decades later, Giroux was a prescient editor with antennae sensitive enough to detect the new. When Giroux began to examine the unraveled manuscript of On the Road, you could see that it was virtually one endless stream of exuberance an exfoliation punctuated primarily by dashes, so he naturally spoke about the necessity of editing. Kerouac's astonishing response was to roll up his manuscript and walk out. This stand was dangerous from any editorial perspective. It negated the role of the midwife of book production. It diminished the potential control of any publisher's representative. Kerouac may have been agitated by the hot flush of his own breakthrough, but his response to an editor's quite normal request was probably one of the more drastic and reckless in the history of American literature. This state of impasse, the state of impasse this presents, seems universal for so many writers. I know, for example, from my own small history, that with each of the books I've been fortunate enough to conceive, write, and actually see published, there was only one person in this huge country besides myself, who cared enough about my idea to encourage me to see it through, and that was my editor. So it's quite difficult for me to imagine the courage, or is it a place, 
located somewhere between impetuosity and folly, to tell that person, well, I don't really need your help, your questions, suggestions, corrections, emanations, qualifications. Since some spiritual power, call it God or Dionysius if you like, dictated this to me, a reed bending in the wind, would it not be blasphemous to revise? Would Moses have argued with the God whom he could not even name as he inscribed the Ten Commandments, asking for a word to be substituted or recommending a semicolon? I suspect most writers are subject to the conflict between the heated demands of the heart's inspiration and more conventional approaches to making writing accessible and perhaps accessible, acceptable. On the Road finally appeared in 1957, six very long years after its composition. The published version was conventionalized by two editors at Viking Press, whom I interviewed, Helen Taylor and Keith Jennison. The rollicking, cascading rhythms of Kerouac's scroll, its surging momentum and endless variability punctuated and organized into predicate and verb propriety. Some might say that Viking's version of what Kerouac had represented, uh, Viking's version of what Kerouac had written represented a literary castration. Kerouac said this especially after reading Visions of Cody, a novel Kerouac wrote with the freedom of On the Road in the same year of 1951, but considered unpublishable during his lifetime and only published posthumously. To its credit, or perhaps as testament to how many copies of On the Road have been sold, Viking Penguin did publish the scroll version of On the Road in 2007. Who introduced exactly Ginsburg as Kerouac had written to, it initially. Uh, 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 when I was Ginsburg writing and Kerouac was Burroughs, murdered a man. Early she caused a man. Of self-defense perhaps. So what? Still murdered. My editor was and George he Johnson. went to jail for it. You know? <laughs> it been Kerouac's Later, became in the, 1957. Uh, uh, the, the top as an editor at McGraw-Hill, when it still had a large trade division, she was more responsible than anyone in America for the revival of interest in Kerouac in the 1970s, as she began posthumously publishing and reprinting many of Kerouac's novels, including Cody. My book, which was published by McGraw-Hill in 1976, was an early attempt to chart the history of the Beats and to determine the value of what they had written. Its title itself, Naked Angels, might indicate a subversive advocacy. Even Allen Ginsberg advised using the more anthropologically accurate title of Naked Humans. <laughs> Young, intemperate, perhaps, I would not listen to him or to Joyce Johnson. She complained that my language sounded sometimes too passionate too rambunctious, too infatuated with my own linguistic overreaching to induce the credibility the beat so desperately needed after two decades of systematic condescension and outright dismissal by establishment media. My response to Joyce Johnson's objections, and it does seem a little silly to me today, was to accept other advice from Allen Ginsberg and flee to Oaxaca, Mexico on an NEH fellowship. <laughs> Ginsberg told me I would not fully get the beats without understanding what the appeal of Mexico had been for them in the early 1950s. So I spent most of 1974 there trying to revise and reimagine my material. Ideally, any writer acts as his or her primary editor. At first, trying to overcome a latent, intoxicating narcissism. My practice is to read the work aloud, 
slowly and deliberately, listening to the rhythm of the sentences and attending to the connections, logical or psychological, between them. Oaxaca was distant enough from New York to help me, especially since I had no easy telephone communication. I was able to create valuable transitional sections for my manuscript on the sunny tennis terrace of the Pension Suiza in Oaxaca, which, hot-headed still, I insisted should appear in italics. I omitted chapters on poets like Gregory Corso, Gary Snyder, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti to focus on what had begun in New York City oh, at, at the end of World War II. I think I learned DC, from Joyce. The ways we control in our own calm, controlled but, uh, prose was a law that charged language is not always convincing. Uh, and drugs and because avalanche in of the same anger word. does not itself persuade that words broiled in oil do not often result in clarity or confusion. That rhetoric, as William Butler Yeats once put it, is often the will straining to do the work of the imagination. Actually, I had learned other lessons about the editing process even earlier. When I was preparing for my doctoral orals at New York University in the 1960s, my study partner, Harold Jaffe, and I had compiled material for a couple of anthologies. We called one of them The American Experience, a Radical Reader, and it was intended to be the first exploration of the political and cultural turbulence of the 1960s. As editors, we chose writing to we found to be powerful, provocative, and representative of the new. Writers like Malcolm X, Lenny Bruce, Timothy Leary, Allen Ginsberg, and others. At that time, there was virtually nothing in print to help explain the conflicts of 60s America. Jaffe and I had no agent, but we were familiar with the telephone. Of course, in those ancient times, one could actually reach an editor that way. We wrote a proposal and shopped it around to those who expressed interest, managing to create a small bidding war because we believed in simultaneous submission. We had been advised that sending a proposal to more than one publisher at a time was an impropriety, a protocol violation of the genteel code supposedly operative in the publishing industry. Nevertheless, ignobly perhaps, we adopted this strategy as a means of survival in a world where we realized the odds were vastly against us, where we did not have years to wait patiently and politely to evaluate rejections, or to sit on Samuel Beckett's desolate heath expecting an answer that might never even come. We received a very generous contract from Harper and Rowe. I bought two handmade suits. But when we turned our project in, our signing editor informed us that his bosses had found some of the material we included too raw or offensive. This was an aspect of the editorial process that Kerouac knew implicitly, and I suppose so many novelists prior to William Burroughs' Naked Lunch knew it, as Edgar Allan Poe once put it, as the shadow of their shadows. The publisher, who was committing to a capital investment in your words, had the potential to lose, especially considering the vast educational market in America. And so, your great Victorian aunt Mammon, who did not live in Victoria, <laughs> who served watery tea without sugar and who had always despised your long hair and crossed leg manners became an informal cultural arbiter. The publisher's role was to censor whatever seemed to violate her sense of the socially acceptable, as had been the case in modern American literature from Dreiser's Sister Carrie to Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. Obliquely, in a hushed undertaker's undertone, it was suggested that we could be su successfully blacklisted by commercial publishers. We didn't believe we were being confronted by gangsters, and ultimately, we negotiated a compromise. We would remove selections that the Harper overlords found sexually 
too suggestive, but not writing that we saw as developing a new political consciousness, such as Malcolm X's piece, The Ballad or the Bullet. We could not make Harper happy, and our sign signing editor, an effusive giant in cowboy boots from Texas, spent the rest of his career in contracts. However, the book sold very well, both as a trade item and as a university test. Hopefully, it may have even helped foster some change. Over the years, the taboo nature of my subjects, writers who quarreled violently with established values, has subjected me to the pressures of editorial qualms whose Anxious hermeneutics signal that cultural nerves were meant to be hidden or being exposed. Allow me to consider two examples. In the winter of 1987, an editor with the New York Times book review introduced them a novel through the main line. Right a here. novel called The Last okay. well, you're not going to find Museum, too often written by a visual artist and painter named Brian Geisen. In Paris in the late 1950s, Geisen had introduced his friend William Burroughs to what they called the cut-up, a technique allowing Burroughs to insert a selection from a news clipping or a writer he admired into the fabric of his own text without attribution, what painters called collage, or contemporary musicians sampling. Set in a bordello, the last museum was deeply influenced by Burroughs, who had provided an introduction. As a reviewer, I thought it was my job to describe some of the bizarre dream sequences and burlesque scenes of twisted sexuality. I submitted the review only to hear from editor Balakian <coughs> that the New York Times would not print a word of it. When I asked why, her icy retort was that she worked for a family newspaper. Since I knew Geisen deserved attention, and that quite possibly the novel would not receive any other notice, I agreed to let her tone down the review by omitting the more salaciously insalubrious details of its plot, at least those that seemed that late in the history of Christian civilization too threatening to the families gathered around the fireside. On another occasion in the following year, I was less accommodating. Working on a book on Henry Miller, I wrote an account of Anais Nin's serial polyandry in the early 1930s in Paris, the period when Miller was writing Tropic of Cancer. She had supported Miller with an allowance paid for his room in the Hotel Princess, where she shared his bed before afternoon tea, and ultimately subsidized the printing costs of Miller's bombshell book when it was completed in 1934. My subject, however, was Nin's remarkable sexual veracity. Besides her stolid husband, the banker Hugo Geiler, Nin would sleep with a progression of other men during the course of the day, including two of her psychiatrists, <laughs> Dr. René Allende and the world-famous Dr. Otto Rank. Uh, uh, so my piece was titillating, if not voyeuristic. Although I had met Nin when she lived in Washington Square Village in the late 1960s, and she had playfully slipped into my lap at a gathering hosted by my colleague, Marianne Hauser, but that's another story called The Dowager and the Dolt. <laughs> my main sources were Nin's copious diaries and the large correspondence she had shared with Millam. The piece, which I call Two Spies in the House of Love, was acquired by a magazine called Fame, a very slick magazine that promptly assigned their cooking expert to edit it into house style, 
which almost always is a euphemism for dull prose. <laughs> she wanted to poach my chicken in cream sauce when I had already deep fried it. She also seemed intent on omitting most of the details I had provided for the sake of authenticity. From the furniture in Nin's rooms in her estate at Louveciennes, just outside Paris, to the salty insinuations of her tongue. Confident that I could sell my story to Vanity Fair or Playboy, I flatly refused all her recommended alterations, causing an editorial impasse. When Gail Love, the magazine's editor-in-chief, called me, desperate to meet her deadline, my unsympathetic and perhaps brutally crude response was, fuck fame. <laughs> I should not have responded so violently, <laughs> though it was a true register of my absolute contempt for the magazine then. I suppose it would have been more cute or clever to have quoted Jack Kerouac's wish that I'd rather be thin than famous. I must admit that when the piece appeared exactly as I had written it, I was extremely gratified. The piece caused enough interest to lead to a contract for a book called Passionate Lives. That title was the publisher's cliché, not mine. And its lesson is that writers aren't always allowed even to entitle their books. Any title is a headline, a telegram to a sleeping public. When I edited Carl Solomon's last book, he was the dedicatee of Allen Ginsberg's Howl, he was working in New York City as a walking messenger and just could not imagine a title for his little collection of pithy, humorously absurdist essays. So I suggested emergency messages because of the frequent, frequent urgency in his voice. That idea worked, at least as far as Carl and his publisher was concerned. But Passionate Lives was about the five competitive, was, was about five competitive modern marriages. And in each, a writer was transfigured by a ravaging love that charged and changed the ways that they spoke to the world. In each case, what they had to say was vitally transformative. One of my subjects was Henry Miller, and my desire had been to call my book Plenty Potentiaries, after a line in Tropic of Cancer in which Miller's nihilistic hero declares that he is here, quote, as a plenty potentiary from the realm of free spirits. The head of the division, of the conglomerate publishing my book, decided that no one in America would know what the word plenipotentiary meant, as if I was trying to confuse his consumers with a book about penitents or penitentiaries. <laughs> <laughs> Clichés, however, do have some value in the world of publishing, which is closely related to its cousins in advertising. Once, when the state of New York ran out of funds to pay the instructional staff at the City University of New York, where I still teach, I'm in my 49th year, I was hired by the Don Wise Agency, a small advertising firm located on 42nd Street, just off Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. I remember its location only because of its centrality, so close to the place of, quote, absolute madness and fantastic who rare Jack Kerouac described at the end of the first part of On the Road, with its, quote, millions and millions hustling forever for a buck among them, amongst themselves. My assignment was to write a history of wallpaper for the Imperial Wallpaper Company of Chicago <laughs> that wanted a brochure for its 50th anniversary. I learned how wallpaper originated in Europe during the Renaissance with the delicate rice paper used by the Chinese to leak to, to, to line the teak tea chests, uh, 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 which the French and English used to paste on the walls above their fireplace mantles. And the rice paper uh, 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 was followed by the ri rich textures of the parchment proclamations issued by Henry VIII. After turning in my copy 
I met with Don Wise, feeling like a dwarf in a giant office that looked down on, New on the New York Public Library across the street. He congratulated my research. Uh, 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 he praised its elegance, but complained that my language was too fastidious because I had failed to employ any cliches. So we had the piece entirely rewritten by one of his trained subordinates, probably an expert in baking buttery croissants, <laughs> to the extent that it was quite unrecognizable by me. My only consolation was the compensation, although the check seemed somehow redolent of grease. <laughs> I do not mean to imply that the editor is the writer's perennial antagonist. Many writers, and I include myself, has worked as editors. The university positions, if one is lucky enough to be able to find them, do afford any writer more time to do the real work. An editor's differing point of view can have intrinsic value, serving to sharpen an argument or clarify its cause. Any editor, a an editor, can sometimes see a logical flaw of which you were unaware, or may suggest a path you could, you just could not discern. Ideally, an editor cultivates your collaboration, responding with tactful sensitivity and some linguistic discretion, as well as the honesty to remark, I don't think this works, and here might be another way. However, we understand that today's labor market employs fewer editors to do more work for less pay. Pressured by a dozen clamoring projects, each more weighty than Michelangelo's marbles, the editor may not be fully attentive when necessary. We've all heard of the editors who merely acquire but then never inquire, those more concerned with commerce than quality, or those so harried by their own crowded schedules they can only offer vague injunctions to remedy this or redo that. When the World Trade Center catastrophe occurred, I was working on a hybrid memoir called Reading New York, contracted to, by Al Alfred A. Knopf. Since the Random House building was being frequently evacuated due to emergency drills and forced false alarm threats, it became quite difficult to contact my editor, the most capable person who had probably stashed her cash under a mattress and was ready to flee. Much of the now invisible editorial responsibility to verify thought and language seems relegated to the deaf curiosity of the copy editor, a shadowy presence as the manuscript is prepared <coughs> for its final galley stage, who points to the misused word, the misused word, the incorrect fact or chronology, the dangling in Felicities, the awkward construction, or the flaccidity of the extraneous. Even the most diligent copy editor, however, can detour a preposition as the esteemed, as the esteemed Harvard Don Harry Levin pointed out in a consequentially in a consequentially caustic dismissal of my pound biography in the New York Review of Books, the most austere and circumspect of review organs. I had four different editors during the decade I devoted to the solitary volcano, my pound project. It had begun quite inauspiciously when I announced it to my mother, the primal editor, and the reason I became a writer in the first place. It was during our last dinner, before she would be taken away to die in an awful hospital battle with leukemia. But how could you? She remarked, outraged still by Pound's notorious anti-Semitism, the very poison that had driven her to seek refuge in this country. Another editor bluntly told me to bury my evolving manuscript in a drawer, at least for a decade. Her successor, fascinated by Gene Stein and George Plimpton's Life of Edie, a popular biography of Edie Sedgwick, one of the glamorous members of Andy Warhol's entourage, advised me to turn seven years of research based on several thousand letters into a pop collage. My book would be much more imaginative, she assured me, if I added and invented juicy conversations, even if no records existed. 
the third editor, was such an evanescent disappearance, I never spoke to her. <laughs> then an editor from Vanity Fair, a magazine I had already written for, asked me for a piece exploring Pound's first meeting with T.S. Eliot, only to offer me a kill fee after I wrote it, because all available space had to be reserved for Dominic Dunn's stories on the murder trial of Klaus von Bula. <laughs> the intrigues of socialites, socialites, I understood, usually trump the predicaments of poets. My fourth editor was Fran McCulloch, a noted cookbook editor with the girth to prove it, and when we met in Venice, Italy, where I was actually writing my book, A Page a Day, in 1985, I took her near my lodging in Dorsoduro to the Antica Locanda Montan, Pound's famous favorite eatery, and the next night, by Vaporetto to Harry Cipriani's on the island of Chiodeca, a restaurant patronized primarily by Italians who knew that most Venetian cuisine was quite inferior, fit only for tourists who would never know any better. I realized that unconsciously, I must have been trying to bribe or at least butter favor with my editor through her palate. But alas, she too was discharged by monolithic Doubleday before even reading a page of my book. Pound himself, of course, was the most adept and brilliant editor of his time. Modernism's sharpened focus begins with his linguistic prescriptions, his warning against the sentimentality caused by painted adjectives, the kind of excess leading to what he once called emotional slither. In an essay, he proposed a poetic line as durable as bone or granite, and he advised in a letter to his friend Iris Barry, I think there must be more, predominantly more, objects than statements and conclusions, which latter are purely optional, not essential, often superfluous, and usually bad. As an editor in London, Pound helped T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, and James Joyce get their initial recognition, and he profoundly affected Yeats with an informal tutorial on imagism at Stone Cottage during parts of three winters before World War I. I suspect he was the person most responsible for building Eliot's confidence, making him believe that he could have a voice that would be heard, getting the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock published in poetry, albeit on its last page because Harriet Monroe felt her subscribers would not be able to understand the poem and entirely reorganizing the wasteland, which Eliot then dedicated to Pound as Il Miglior Fabro, the greater craftsman. Ernest Hemingway may have given Pound boxing lessons in Paris in the early 1920s, but I believe that when Pound first read his stories, he helped hone his style according to the imagist precepts he had been propagating. And the chiseled minimalism that became so well known as Hemingway's style was much more due to Pound than to Gertrude Stein's more Jamesian indirection and circumlocution. By the time I submitted my Pound manuscript to Marshall de Brule, Doubleday's editor in chief, I had no active editor. I felt flattened to insignificance, to say the least, by his imperturbable acknowledgement that he had never even heard of my project. Much to my relief, <laughs> this is like eight years into the project, okay? Uh, and after they had fronted a considerable amount of money to me, I should have just taken it and run. Uh, much to my relief, a month later, in the unbelievable an almost unbearable cacophony of the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station, he announced that he so admired the book he would not change a word. Choking on a shrimp, perhaps, <laughs> because I could barely hear him in the day that sounded like a muffled enunciation, divine, but one made ambiguous because of the clatter of dishes and the oceanic volume of noisy conversation. I realized how rarely this sort of editorial sanctions in the production of any book. I do wonder what would have happened had Robert Giroux responded similarly to Kerouac's scrolling scroll in 1951. 
What's most astonishing to me about the six subsequent years, during which Kerouac could not find a new publisher for On the Road or anything else, is his persistence. Despite all the difficulties any writer encounters, the isolation, the psychic consequences of concentration, the more mundane uh, uh, reports of work for hire contracts, reports of the end of mid-list publishing, the disappearing market for serious fiction. Most of all, faced with rejection and unsympathetic editors, the writer needs a strong dose of practically indomitable belief in one's creative capacities, the measure of which in Kerouac's case is the six novels he wrote in those six years, from 1951 to 1957, despite his anonymity, his often desperate circumstances, and considerable depression. It makes me marvel that anything except celebrity confessionals and cookbooks get written and certainly published at all. I do not offer this memory as a final reflection on the editing process, its perils and promise. I learn much more about what an editor can accomplish and what I would call the donkey burden of that role when my friend, the novelist Ronald Sukunek, persuaded me to help edit the American Book Review, a magazine he was starting to allow more prominence for the writer's voice. It would become an opportunity for me, he said, to give back to the literary community. And he was right. Over the years, I was able to discover then unknown but genuine writers like Luke Sante, who would receive his first publication, in American Book Review. One of my key responsibilities for American Book Review in its early days was finding the most interesting books to assign. I would assort several large canvas U.S. mail sacks a week right on the street outside Cooper Square Station in Lower Manhattan where the American Book Review had its postal box and then load the sacks into my old Toyota. Then I would drive the poetry books a mile downtown to Rochelle Ratner on Spring Street. Rochelle had the fiat on poetry. She was the scrupulous Robespierre of our small, small editorial crew who scrutinized excessive praise, searching for sweetheart reviews. Most of the rest of the books were destined for the Strand bookstore. And I would slide the sacks down the basement stairs of that venerable emporium of used books for resale. <laughs> this was a primary source of support for American Book Review, <laughs> along with a few modest grants from arts councils. Imagine my shock when once, loading the books, still in their official postal mail sacks, I was apprehended by two excited postal inspection inspectors who claimed I was stealing the United States mail. <laughs> Even on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, theft can hardly be considered an editorial prerogative. <laughs> and editing, like writing, has its hazards. <laughs> Uh, uh, all of the books that I've written have come out with commercial presses because I'm greedy. <laughs> I admit it. I believe that writers should be paid and that I in particular should be paid <laughs> because I know how hard the work is. It would be different if I was working at a soup kitchen and giving out soup. That's not so hard. Uh, I would do that for free, and I have. But writing I don't like to do for free. So I believe in being rewarded. And therefore, the publisher wants it to be saleable. So in Kerouac's case, with the scroll manuscript of On the Road, the publisher was right. That book would have disappeared into the void had it been accepted in 51. I think it's fortunate, frankly, myself, that it was delayed until 57, when there could be a more of a sympathetic uh, atmosphere. By 57, things have changed. The 50s was beginning to decompose, you see. So, so that uh, um, Kerouac could could have a voice, and also the fact that they conventionalized the manuscript, or castrated, as Kerouac put it, <coughs> meant that it could be read by many more people. If you try to read the scroll manuscript, you'll have as much difficulty as you have reading Joyce's Ulysses. 
you know. It, it, you're going to get lost. There's no punctuation. We need punctuation. We, we mere mortals need punctuation. Some punctuation, at least. We have to know when to pause. You know. Okay. <laughs> After World War One, we had the uh, expatriates in, in France, in Paris, the yes. lost generation. Uh, After World War Two, we have what we call the beat generation. After we're finished with the two wars we're in now, seven. I'm sorry. Seven wars, but seven. anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what will Some of them have? have been declared, the others just haven't been declared yet, but you know, it's seven, okay. Okay, what, what, what will we have, and I know we have, you know, flash fiction, uh, we have uh, multimedia type stuff. What, in your idea, do we... I'm writing a novel on my cell phone. You want to read it? I'll just send it to you. So, yeah, so no, I mean, I mean, you know, this is scary, actually, to me. I, I offer this as a joke. You know, I'm not really writing a novel on myself. I'm barely able to use it, you know. And the only reason I have it is I'm in Texas. My wife insists to be able to reach me at any moment. Okay? Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, your guess about the future is as good as mine, and this might be the way. <laughs> Sir? Uh, you know, mentioning the expatriates in this room. Um, and, and looking for what we might have after these wars. Do you think there's been anything since the beatniks that has resembled anything like the beatniks or the expatriates in terms of a small encampment of people with a familiar estate? First, I have to take exception to the term you're using. That is an insulting term invented by a gossip columnist in San Francisco named Herb Cain after Sputnik to put the followers of the beat writers down. He called them beatniks. So we never use that word in polite circumstances. <laughs> now, can you rephrase the question? <laughs> Politely. What term should you have to use? Beat. Beats. Okay. Since the beats, there hasn't really been a small encampment of violence. It has no. been quite the same as the beats were the expats. Um, why do you think that might be? Well, you know, I think that literary gatherings are most rare. Uh, first of all, the expatriates, the so-called lost generation in Paris, were very loosely defined, because mostly because of Hemingway's uh, fictitious memoir, uh, Movable Feast, where he has two chapters of condescension for Fitzgerald, whom he justly understood was his rival for the title of the great American boxer and writer, boxer, it's the same thing. Uh, from Hemingway's point of view, he was a very pugilistic fellow. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, they went to Gertrude Stein's salon, and Ezra Pound flipped over on her favorite rocking chair and broke it, and he was exiled. But they weren't really uh, a gathering in the way that Beats were, who remained friends for life to the very end. And their correspondence proves it. And, you know, maybe they were the last group who uh, uh, wrote letters to each other, because people don't write letters any longer, alas. They, you know, send emails or uh, speak on the telephone, or maybe they don't even do that. I mean, the Beats were bonded by murder and drugs in 1944 in Manhattan. One of their, the person who introduced Ginsburg to uh, 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 Ginsburg and Kerouac to Burroughs murdered a man. Lucian Carr murdered a man. In self-defense, perhaps, but so what? It's still murder. And he went to jail for it, you know? Later, incidentally, became the, uh, uh, the, the top dog at a place called United Press International in Washington, D.C., which is one of the ways we control the news in this country. But uh, uh, Lucian came from a very distinguished family and had family connections. Uh, and drugs because in the same week in 1944, a Times Square hustler named Herbert Hunky uh, introduced them all to morphine through the main line, which is right here. Okay, well, you're not going to find that happen too often in the history of culture. 
that kind of bonding, you know? Uh, so they really were a movement. Though I, did, I, I, you know, and it's true that, you know, if you, what's the common point uh, for the Beats? They were very transgressive on every level. You know, on every level. They thought uh, that the system, uh, the American imperial system was at the point of collapse. And they were predicting that. They may have been right, they may have not been right, I don't know. I'm not Oswald Spengler, but they read Spengler. They were influenced by Spengler. Uh, it was Burroughs, who had already done graduate work at Harvard, that gave the younger Kerouac and Ginsburg uh, the decline and fall. Uh, so they had a common philosophical point of view. Uh, at the same time, they were quite different, particularly Burroughs and Kerouac. Quite different. Uh, uh, and um, uh, despite the ideological and stylistic differences, they cohered as a group uh, out of a kind of love, out of a kind of comradeship that's really unprecedented in the history of literature, any literature. I mean, you have isolated, you know, you have uh, uh, Rambeau falling in love with Verlaine and getting stabbed, I mean, shot for it by Verlaine. Uh, uh, you don't have too many instances of that kind of closeness. So, you know, I don't think this is going to happen again. I don't think we should expect it. I think it's an accident. I think, you know, I mean, now uh, you find young people living communally for economic reasons. They can't afford to live alone. Uh, but the fact that these three writers shared an apartment on 115th Street and, Rivers and uh, uh, Broadway uh, across from Columbia in 1944 and 1945. It was quite unusual then. You know? People had lived communally in Emerson's time in the 1840s and 1850s on Brook <coughs> Farm uh, 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 and other communal uh, attempts at transcendentalists, but they really haven't since. <laughs> yes. I had two questions, but just back, just at the very end when you said you were at the beginning of book review, the American book review, can you tell us more about the beginning? <laughs> we're a world away from Cooper Square. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, Cooper Square is just where the postal box was located. We didn't have an office. The office was our homes. You know, uh, uh, Ron Sukunik would come in from Boulder and meet at my place on Perry Street or Rochelle's place on Spring Street, and we would conduct the work of the review periodically in that way, and it was very ad hoc and informal and uh, with a lot of autonomy delegated to various people living in various parts of the country, actually, because it did attempt to have a national scope, and right from the beginning, we didn't want to make it a New York organ, even though a couple of the editors lived in that area. I did, Rochelle did, Charles Russell did, Suzanne Zabrian did. Uh, uh, we tried to have an outlook about what was happening about writing, particularly with the small press movement, which I regarded as being tremendously important to the health of this country at a time when the publishing houses were getting fewer, and the big ones were getting fewer and fewer, and they weren't even owned by Americans. They were owned by Europeans. I thought this was not necessarily the healthiest thing for us. If opinion is going to be controlled by the biggest <laughs> publishing conglomerate in Germany, and I worked for them, Bertelsmann, they published a couple of my books, you know, with Knopf, uh, uh, Random House, for example. Uh, I don't mean to sound like a chauvinist. I'm not a chauvinist. I'm an internationalist. But I think that uh, uh, expression is so important to the integrity of a country that we should have some Americans owning publishing houses, too. Thank God for the small press movement as a result. Because I think it's a route to freedom. And I think that that was one of the purposes of American Book Review. Uh, uh, the other was to give the writer a voice, a clear voice, in assessing writing, uh, which we felt wasn't available at that time. But it was pretty much an ad hoc spontaneous gathering in the beginning. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, it's one o'clock now. Um, there are some books for sale. I think we have a vast assortment of uh, John Titel's works on, on display. Not everything, but 
so you can browse through those. Let's thank John again for I think following up on, on Janice, you know, we've had um, uh, a number of the editors of the book review come out. We've had a lot of originary stories come out. It'd be fun to kind of collect some of that footage mm. and put it all together. Mm. There's a little, you know, there are different stories out there. But thank you for your service and, and to the book review and, you know, wonderful. John still contributes uh, as an editor, uh, writing reviews, uh, a signing, and we really appreciate that, even though we're in Victoria and <laughs> not, in, not in the village. So thanks again. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you.